Hello, and welcome to uh, project introduction for Jaeger. Uh, my name is Yuri Shkro. Um, this month is the fifth anniversary of Jaeger starting at Uber uh, from the first commit. It's in August. Um, and so congrats to the project. Um, as far as the agenda, so I will start with a brief introduction of uh, why tracing is an important um, part of the observability for your systems. Uh, I will do a short uh, live demo of Jaeger features. We'll talk about Jaeger architecture. Uh, we'll talk about sampling. And I want to finish with discussion about uh, the relationship between Jaeger and OpenTelemetry and how these two projects are collaborating. Um, to say a few words about myself, I'm a software engineer at Uber. Um, I started uh, Jaeger as an internal project and then we donated it to Cloud Native Foundation. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of uh, Open Tracing and Open Telemeter projects, which are the instrumentation uh, projects for tracing. And I also published a book last year about tracing and my experiences at Uber, as well as experiences with Jaeger and how to deploy it and configure and things like that. You can find uh, my contact information on, on my website uh, with a blog and, and other information. So. To start with, with the, the first question of observability, um, why tracing is important in microservices, especially in microservices architectures, um, and why it becomes popular today? Um, so <clears throat> modern systems uh, have to deal with a very large scale. And the traditional wisdom is that we cannot scale up our servers because there's a limit to how much a, any given server can process. And so uh, usually people say, okay, well, we need to scale out and build the architecture in that way. But what does scale out actually mean? The simplest uh, approach to scaling out is that if you have a, a monolith service, you can just replicate it multiple times uh, in many hosts and put a load balance in front of it. And if that's the whole of your architecture, then you have a pretty uh, clear picture of uh, how to debug these things and what the observability story is it, because you could probably get away with just metrics for every single instance tagged with the instance name, and then you can investigate problems with this architecture. But in reality, this is not how the systems are built today. Um, and this is another type of scaling uh, that we can talk about. It's, it's scaling the systems in, in depth, uh, meaning that we don't have a single monolith. We actually break monolith into many, many different pieces and many different layers. And so any individual request that, that hits the architecture has to go through all these many layers so modern architectures are really deep systems, uh, if you look at any of them. And deep systems present unique challenges in terms of observability. If we look at uh, this picture, which is just a, a screenshot of uh, microservices layout at Uber a few years ago. Um, so imagine that there is a request coming from the mobile application. That request might look like this when it hits the, this architecture, right? It, it goes through a large number of services uh, all participating together and inserting one single request. Um, and we can look at it in a different way. This is the actual representation of the real production request from, from Uber, right? It might be an application start. Uh, and we can see here there's like over 100 uh, remote procedure calls within the, that execution, uh, 14 levels of depth. So why is that a problem for observability? Well, the problem is that now we have to answer questions uh, about... Uh, what's wrong with the system, uh, given so many different nodes in the system that where the things can go wrong, right? And how do we start with that? We, we approach it usually with, oh, we have some business metrics, maybe number of trips in a particular city, and suddenly that metrics dipped. Uh, and so we have an alert and we try to investigate, but then, then what? Where do you go from that business metric saying something is wrong to where in this massive architecture a particular change happened that is causing this problem. And, and this is where tracing really comes in because tracing allows us to look at, at a individual requests in full depth, end to end. And if there are errors happening, they will be captured in the trace. Um, and so the, the conclusion here is that this is why tracing is important because uh, in, in the modern deep systems, um, sometimes it's much more difficult to find where the problem is given the, how distributed the system is. Uh, rather than what is specifically wrong. Because once you narrow down the problem, there are a lot of a variety of different tools that you can use to troubleshoot it within, let's say, a single instance of a service. Uh, but even to get there, it's very challenging, especially if you're starting from an alert on a business metric. Um, 
I just want to give a brief uh, kind of crash course into tracing if you don't know how that works. Uh, the, the tracing is built on the concept of a context propagation, uh, meaning that when the request comes to our architecture, in this case, let's say service A at the top is the uh, kind of gateway service maybe, uh, or API service. And uh, as soon as the request comes in, we assign a unique ID to that request, let's call it a trace ID, and we store it in a thing which we call a context or a metadata. And that metadata is attached to every single other RPC call or request that the execution of this top level request involves, right? And so as service A calls service B, we will pass that metadata in and so on and so on. Uh, and what that does is basically that allows us to tag the, a single execution across multiple services um, and then assemble this data on the back end into a coherent representation of the of the execution. And this is kind of a typical representation of a trace in the Gantt chart where each service is represented by a certain span of time uh, where like from start to end of the operation within that service. And then there is a hierarchical relationship between, uh, between services, um, like a causality, which is being tracked by this metadata being propagated. Now let's look at the demo of Jaeger features. So I have here um, a clone of uh, main Jaeger repository from GitHub, Jaeger tracing slash Jaeger. And there's a directory uh, for examples uh, with a single sample application called Hotrod. So in that application, we can see there's a Docker compose file um, which loads uh, so-called Jaeger all-in-one. This is a a binary uh, of a single binary that combines all of the Jaeger components in just one executable, so you can kind of easily run it. And then there is another uh, Docker image for the actual demo applications, right? So let's start it. Uh, we can see in the logs uh, there are two things. So Jaeger is the, the main Jaeger backend. So it starts on, on this uh, port 16686. This is the query service, which also serves the front end, the UI. And then the, the demo application started a whole bunch of services. Uh, the, the one that's at 8080 is the one that we actually want to look at. So let's go there. Uh, so we can see this is a kind of a mock rides on demand application where you have customers and you can click a button and, and get a car. Right? So let's uh, order. Uh, a few cars, and we can see here there's like a license plate, uh, ETA of arrival, uh, then some tracking information for, for debugging purposes, uh, and, and the latency. And we can see that the latency kind of, the more requests we put in, the, the higher the latency becomes, right? So like if I, if I do another request, it will be short, uh, but if I send many of them, then we'll see that the latency keeps climbing, right? Let's look at how these requests look in Jaeger. So we'll go to localhost at this port that I mentioned previously. Um, and we can see here in the services dropdown that uh, Jaeger already detected uh, all of our services in that mock application. It also detected itself because uh, Jaeger query itself is instrumented and so we can get traces from it. Um, so, but we're interested in, 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 in the hot rod uh, application. But before we jump into traces, would it be nice if we knew what the architecture of that application is? Because all we've seen so far is a front end. Right? Uh, and so Jaeger has the system architecture tab for this. Uh, there's two views. One is not like useful for this case, but the DAG view is, is, is good uh, because it gives us very clear picture of what all the services that are included in this application, how they're connected, uh, this is like a number of requests uh, that were executed during my run of the demo. Let's go to see what uh, what actual traces look like, right? So there's a few ways that you can search for traces. Um, one is uh, we can just go and do a blind search. Uh, once we selected the service, uh, we can just see and find all of them, right? Uh, the other option, we can do a search by specific values if they are captured in an instrumentation. And in this case, the instrumentation uh, records these uh, license plates as the tag driver on the span of the of the service, and so we can put it in a search query, and we get just this one trace, right? And if we go in that trace, uh, so let's let's just go through that view, which is kind of the main view of of most tracing systems, uh, at least for for a given trace, right? So here on we have a timeline. Uh, so this is also known as a, as a Gantt chart view. 
Um, in at the top we have a, what we call a mini map. It's kind of the small presentation of the trace. It's useful when you need to navigate very large traces because you can zoom in here uh, and uh, jump into various places. But in this case, uh, almost all of the trace, well, actually half of it still fits only on the screen. So uh, the mini map might be useful as well. Um, then on the left, we have um, all the services uh, laid out in a hierarchical manner showing what uh, how, how which service called which other service, right? Um, so we can, if we collapse everything and then open only uh, one level, we will see that, uh, well, actually one more level, we can see here that the front end service called the customer, then it called the root service multiple times uh, and also called the driver service here, right? So which is what what we've seen in the in architecture diagram. Um, and uh, and basically, every every bar here represents a single span within the service. Uh, you can see that, let's say, if we pick a front end, there is more than one span here, even though logically there is only one operation. Because uh, the way the tracing instrumentation is done, it creates a span not only for every incoming request but also for every outgoing request. So uh, this uh, HTTP get dispatch that was the entry point into the front end service, but then when it made a call another HTTP call to the to the customer service, there was another child span, so-called client span created there. And if we click on any span, we can get uh, additional details. So let's look at the, at the root span. So the one thing that we have in spans are things called tags. Tags are just some uh, metadata that you can attach to the spans and it gets recorded and sent into in the background to the yeah, tracing backend. So we can see various useful things, specifically like the, the exact URL. Uh, you don't want to put the URL in the span name because that will make it very high cardinality and difficult to aggregate. Uh, but in the tags, you can put any kind of cardinality. And uh, this is just, I think, uh, nonsense for the UI. Uh, cache busting. Uh, and then another interesting thing here is uh, a span kind, uh, which says this is a server span, right? So if we look at the next one, as I said, this is an outgoing outgoing call, uh, or sorry, this one doesn't uh, have this, this one. Um, it will have uh, a span kind of client, so which says this is the uh, the call I'm making out of the process to, to the next server, and we can see that the URL here is it's, it's hitting the customer service. Going back to the top span, um, another thing that we can see here is that the logs section, right? So uh, in in the output here, we can see that there's like, uh, as, as I was executing this request, there's a bunch of logs written to the standard out, right? And this is normal, um, you can pipe them into some central uh, log aggregator. aggregator um, but uh, they're kind of very difficult to use because, again, if, if there are multiple concurrent requests, you get a single jumble of, of these log lines mixed together. Whereas here, these logs belong just to a single request, right? And this, the way they get into the trace is that uh, if you look at the implementation of Hot Rod application, it has a special wrapper for the logger so that logger not only logs to standard out, but also writes to the current span. Uh, and that allows you to kind of get the exact same information, uh, but uh, like filtered out from the from the rest of the noise that you can see in the logs. So this is a very powerful feature of tracing that allows you to investigate problems um, within like very specific uh, execution of your of your total trace. Uh, now let's uh, expand everything again and look at uh, what what the trace can also tell us. Uh, so one thing that's immediately obvious is that there is this MySQL select which takes uh, the majority, like two thirds of the total time of this request, right? So if we were uh, investigating the latency problem, then this is a clearly the path where we would look for, for why this, this particular place is, is very slow. And it also has some interesting logs. I'm not gonna go into, into this much too much, but it says waiting for log behind three transactions. So it's probably not the actual query that was uh, uh, taking so long, but the, the operation was simply stuck. In, in your service, right? So there might be some resource pool contention here. Um, the, the other thing we can see in the trace is that uh, there's multiple calls from the driver to Redis service. Um, some of them failed as, as can be indicated by this uh, red exclamation point. And the way that uh, that is detected is that if you look at the tags, you will see error equals true, right? So again, this is uh, instrumentation setting it up. You can always do it for your own spans or your own operations, uh, how you see fit. Uh, Jaeger simply just displays this. 
these errors have the ability to uh, bubble up the tree. So if I start uh, collapsing uh, things, then we can see here that the driver is shown with an error, even though there was no specific error in the driver. Uh, but then if you expand it, then it's actually below, right? So sometimes it's useful when you look in at the very top of the trace to know if there are any errors, and then you can drill down into where they exactly they happened. Um, and finally, uh, another thing that uh, we can easily tell from the trace in terms of like analyzing performance of the application is that these calls to Redis seem to be happening all in a, in a sort of a staircase pattern, right, one after another. So that would clearly be an indication of something that potentially can be improved. Uh, because if we know the, the business logic of the application here, uh, it looks like it's getting like driver information for different drivers. And so why couldn't it ask Redis for that in parallel or in a single bulk request, right? So that would have saved uh, this, this much time basically by doing this all in, in one. Uh, and finally, the last segment where the front application calls into the root service asking what is the closest route for the driver to get to us so that we can compute the ATA, then we can see here that uh, this execution is not as bad because there are some concurrent requests going on, but there is no more than three concurrent requests for some reason, right? So the this stop uh, one, two, three, and then once as soon as one st stops, then the, the other one starts. So this is again an indication of some sort of a resource pool contention. This is like an executor pool uh, that's uh, limited by three and you cannot execute more than that. And so if you run multiple concurrent requests, then they're all gonna be blocking on this thing. But in this case, we don't see it because the contention, the main contention is really is the MySQL uh, span. If, you, if I go back to search screen, the one thing I didn't talk about it is, uh, is uh, kind of what, what you get on the search screen. So um, we, we, you can also search for traces uh, by other attributes, specifically by duration, right? Which could be very useful because if you are capturing a lot of traces in the system, some of them are maybe very short and quick and you are not really interested in investigating them. You really want to look at what your P99 latency uh, traces and presumably you have some metric which says, oh, your P99 latency is like two seconds, right? And you can put a query saying, can you show me traces which are longer than 1.5 seconds, right? And so then boom, we only have one trace here in this case. If I make it maybe like one second, I get a few more, right? Um, so uh, that, that allows you to narrow down the search and then investigate uh, the, what the differences are uh, in, in these traces. But sometimes um, looking at one single trace doesn't necessarily reveal all the problems that there might be ha happening uh, in terms of performance. And uh, typically when you use normal uh, performance profiling tools like memory allocations, you would take a snapshot before and after and then you compare those snapshots, right? And so Jaeger also has this ability to do the comparison. Uh, you can select two traces, uh, and then click compare. And what it does is it combines them into, into the graph representation and uses green and red color coding to indicate where there are missing or extra nodes. Uh, in this case, because there's only one uh, extra node, so the, the picture is not that interesting, but if we had a very large trace, then that picture gets a lot more interesting. And I can show you later in the slides, uh, an example from real production traces. Um, and finally, the last piece I wanna show here is, um, uh, we've looked at the system architecture before this one, um, right? There is another view that Jaeger has, which is called deep dependency graph. It's built from the search results. Let me remove this uh, duration so that I can get more traces. So 12 traces. Uh, and then deep dependency graph builds uh, uh, an execution, um, like a, a representation of that, of those traces. However, it looks very similar to the system architecture, but there is a significant difference in that this, this graph is transitive. So when you see an error going through the uh, like front end service to driver and then to Redis, uh, we know that there is actually a path in some of the traces that goes through these two services. Whereas in the system architecture, um, that's not guaranteed. So um, just because there is a, kind of an error from front end to customer doesn't mean that there is any request from front end which will reach the MySQL, right? Because this graph is based on just the pairwise connections between services. Uh, and so why is that important is because uh, sometimes, oops, sorry, I need to search again. Uh, uh, when you investigate in like dependencies of the services, you not only want to see what are my immediate dependencies on, their, on the front end service, but you want to like look for deeper dependencies, but only those which actually matter. Because if there is a dependency of root service, let's say it's doing some background caching and hit some, some storage, 
here, which never affects any of the front end requests, then we don't show it here because it does not come up in the traces, right? Uh, and another feature of this graph is that uh, it's, it, it's not gonna show you the whole architecture, but only pass going through the focal service, which is why it's in pink here. So we can refocus this view to another service and then it will become even smaller. Uh, for example, on driver, right? Because there's no path that go through driver and also through the customer service. So they're not gonna be shown here. Uh, and finally, uh, this graph is also, uh, can show you uh, operation level view, not just a service level view, right? And so we can see here that there are actually two different operations from the Redis that are being called. Uh, and so they can, you can switch to this in the layout view. You can, uh, you can change the graph to, to show you different information. Um, so this graph, we, we built it as a sort of a platform to, to do more stuff with it, specifically overlay and real-time information like what's your current latency or error rates on these graphs. Right now it's not hooked up uh, in any way, but this is kind of the future direction that we're going with. So I think this, uh, th this is uh, all I wanted to show you in the demo. So, and then I will switch to my slide deck um, and uh, I'll start with this, sorry, uh, with this uh, view that I mentioned of a production trace where you compare it to traces. And we can see here that because um, this, 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 these two traces are much larger, uh, there also they have a lot more interesting differences, right? And so at the red at the bottom shows that a whole number of calls uh, did not happen in the, in the right-hand side trace. Uh, and so, for example, if we look at the duration, the left one was 2.7 seconds, the right one is 1.4. And so, well, because this whole section is missing, that kind of explains why it was faster, but it also, potentially there was an error there, right? And so, yeah, I will skip this detail. The, the, there's another way to, to look at this uh, comparison of the traces. So this comparison is currently structural. So we just compare and do the nodes exist in one versus another graph, right? But uh, we also may look sometimes at the, uh, at the latency differences within each individual span, right? Um, and so the latency difference is, is kind of uh, gives you a very different picture, uh, but also drives your... Um, site immediately to the problems where you want to investigate, right? So here we can see, we're using like a heat map color coding for, for like the, the darker red, the darker the red, the, the more latency differences in, is within these nodes. Uh, and then the like white nodes means that some of the nodes were not even present in, in, in the right hand side trace, whereas gray means it's like there are no difference. And so we can see, for example, that kind of the, the overall latency difference came into in this path, right? So it got lighter, 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 but this is kind of one of the suspect spans that you might want to drill down and, and look at what was happening there. Uh, and if you um, mouse over uh, these uh, nodes, it actually shows you how much extra time was spent in this specific span and how what the percentage of time overall of the trace was wasted there. Um, so I believe this, this view is actually still not in the main branch. It, it's like in the pull request, unfortunately. So you can probably try it right away, but... Um, so uh, in the conclusion, you can use tracing tool to monitor transactions in your distributed architecture and see where the requests are executing, which services is being hit and what happens in every step of the way, right? Uh, we can also do root cause analysis by looking at individual details, like what tags exist in each span, uh, like maybe a SQL query or a URL uh, or some errors where they happen and so then we can drill down into those. Uh, we can also look at various patterns of how the time, li time layout uh, of the trace look. And so we can detect immediately patterns like what's the longest critical path, what's the staircase pattern, why it's happening sequentially, and things like that. These uh, visualizations make it very easy to troubleshoot. Um, and finally, we can do um, various service dependency analysis on these traces by using this system graph and, and the transitive dependency graph. Um, and as I mentioned, all of that is based on the distributed context propagation, which is provided by Jaeger SDKs. Um, and so now let's talk about Jaeger architecture and overall Jaeger project. So uh, Jaeger as a platform uh, consists of these four components. Uh, it has a, a, a number of uh, client libraries, also called SDKs or tracers, uh, in different languages. You can see it on the left. They all implement open tracing API. Um, and so th those are the things that you put inside your application or inside the framework that you're using within your application, right? And they collect data and they send it out uh, to the Jaeger backend. And that's the, the middle piece here, trace collection backend, uh, which includes storage, 
uh, some pre-processing, some potential aggregations and things like that. Uh, and backend also feeds into the data mining platform where you can run big job analysis, big data analysis like uh, Flink jobs for real-time streaming or Spark uh, and create aggregates or views of your traces. For example, the system graph uh, in the demo, it was like all in memory, but uh, you can deploy it in such a way that it will actually compute uh, from a from large amount of traces and give you the, the visualizations. And finally, the, the front end is embedded in the Jaeger queries I mentioned uh, and provides you different views of the traces. Um, one thing that <laughs> is worth mentioning is that Jaeger project by itself does not provide instrumentation, right? So if you have no instrumentation in your application, you're not going to get traces. Uh, and we don't have auto instrumentation agents either. Uh, and this was a, a conscious decision uh, because those aspects of, of, um, of distributed tracing are, are taken care of by projects like Open Tracing and Open Telemetry. And I'll later speak about what that means. Uh, and so you need to get instrumentation somehow uh, so that you can start exporting data. And Jaeger deals with uh, collecting that data and presenting and analyzing it. Um, so uh, as far as history, so by the way, Jaeger means hunter. Uh, and uh, don't spell it please with Jaeger. That's not the official name. Um, it was inspired by uh, Dapper uh, from Google and, and OpenZipkin. As I mentioned, we created it at Uber and then uh, donated to Cloud Native Foundation. And now it's a top level uh, graduated project at Cloud Native Foundation. Um, so how Jaeger fits in, in your architecture, uh, is, is, is the slide tries to explain that. So let's say you have two services, A and B, right? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you need to have some form of instrumentation in those services. And there are various options that you have. You, you can have uh, open tracing instrumentation with lots of libraries are supported by open tracing that you can just plug in and you don't have to do much in your code really, uh, just initialize some things. Uh, and, uh, and then we also include uh, a Jaeger SDK, which simply implements that open tracing uh, binding so that when instrumentation captures the data, it just gives it into the Jaeger tracer and then tracer is possible to send it to Jaeger backend, right? Uh, however, there are two data paths that you can see here on the screen. The, to the, the top one in, in a solid line is so-called in-band uh, uh, data, which is when the service A makes a request to service B, it includes a certain metadata about the trace in that request. That's a very small piece of data, like usually trace ID, span ID, and sampling flag. Uh, and there are different formats that are supported. So Jaeger has its own native format that was originally developed at Uber, but there is also now a W3C standard uh, format called trace context that you can also configure Jaeger SDKs to use to communicate between services. And we also support Zipkin B3 format, which is another uh, alternative of that. Um, and so uh, that's how the trace information gets into the service B, which it reads that metadata and then creates, uh, again, tracing data to send it out of band. And so the trace data that goes to the Jaeger backend is really is sent in the background uh, by background threads. Um, and it does not like happen on the critical path of the application where this part happens, the top part, on, on the critical path, right? It's part of your request execution flow. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, you don't actually have to have necessarily Jaeger tracers in your service because there is other ways you can instrument. You can instrument it with Zipkin, like a Brave uh, library, or you can instrument with various open telemetry SDKs. Uh, they all kind of support Jaeger um, as, as a data format. Except that if it's Zipkin, then Jaeger itself supports Zipkin format. But Jaeger backend can combine all of the data and present you in the form of traces. Um, so this is the architecture so, um, of, of Jaeger itself, right? So on the left, again, imagine that you have your application and you have Jaeger client or Jaeger SDK running inside that application. And the typical deployment that we recommend is that you run Jaeger agent, uh, which is a small process, uh, as, a, as a host agent, so that you don't have to like run my, many of them on one host. Although if you do want, you can run it as a sidecar in the classic like pod, uh, Kubernetes pod, so that uh, every application will have its own. Jaeger agent is really, it just uh, is a proxy. It knows how to find Jaeger backend and, and send the data there. Um, so you don't actually have to use it. You can configure Jaeger clients to go directly to collector, but then you have to deal with some discovery, maybe like UNS, uh, sorry, DNS uh, name. Uh, so that uh, like collectors can be located. Whereas when the agent is local to the host, you just send it to a local port. Uh, and also 
uh, with the agent, you can use UDP so that um, it's sort of like, uh, it's a telemetry data, it's not a big deal if you lose it. Uh, whereas when you send to Jaeger collector, you can't really use UDP, so you have to use uh, some HTTP uh, protocol to send the data. Uh, and then Jaeger collector uh, receives all the traces from multiple applications and saves them to the database. You can also have Spark or Flink jobs running off of the database. Uh, and then Jaeger query visualizes that thing. Uh, and the last piece, which is shown in the red here, is, is a control flow. This is um, something that we've built from the beginning into Jaeger architecture, uh, which I'll speak to uh, when, when we talk about sampling. It allows you to push configuration back into the Jaeger SDKs to affect how the sampling is done in the application. Um, however, this was the architecture that we initially uh, ran uh, at Uber, uh, and later on we switched to, to, to slightly different architecture where after Jaeger Collector we introduced Kafka um, before a component which writes spans in, into storage, right? So the Jaeger collector got split into collector and in ingester and indexer. And the reason we did that is because um, when you sometimes have a traffic spikes uh, or some application uh, is deployed with like a sampling of 100%, it's very easy to send too much data that Jaeger collector is simply not able to save fast enough into this database uh, because database have like a throughput limit. Um, and whereas Kafka is usually a, a more elastic uh, storage, you can think of it, uh, that, that can accommodate uh, huge traffic spikes. And so this was one reason we introduced it. So like we don't lose data when there is a traffic spike, we just write more to Kafka and then we experience a certain ingestion delay or lag as a result because it takes a bit more time to save it to the database. And so the traces are not immediately available in, to the query. Uh, but another uh, serious reason why we introduced Kafka is because it allows us to, to start building Flink jobs uh, to do aggregations like the dependency graphs um, in real time rather than running Spark job, which has to read the whole database. And, and like, this is, uh, doing it in real time is much more um, interactive and you get um, data faster into, into your system and it reacts faster. So this is what we're currently running at Uber. And uh, again, you don't have to use Kafka. You can go directly to the database. It's really, it really depends on what you want to get from this. Um, and uh, the technology stack uh, to mention for Jaeger is it's uh, backend is all written in Go. Uh, we support pluggable storage. There are two ways. There is um, uh, several backends which are natively supported directly by the binaries that we uh, distribute, specifically Cassandra, Elasticsearch, Badger, which is a sort of single node storage on disk. Uh, and also there's like a toy in memory um, implementation that is used by all-in-one uh, binary. Uh, however, there is also another uh, pluggable solution called gRPC plugins where you can implement any kind of storage backend uh, communicating over gRPC with the Jaeger backend, uh, with the Jaeger collector. And that allows uh, sort of uh, us to, to extend the capabilities to other storage engines uh, without kind of bringing all of that maintenance uh, overhead into Jaeger, main Jaeger repository. Uh, the front end is built in JavaScript and React it is pretty standard. Uh, Instrumentation libraries or like um, SDKs are all implementing open tracing and we integrated with um, various like Kafka and Apache Flink frameworks. And as I mentioned, Zipkin compatibility involves two things. We can, uh, Jaeger clients understand Zipkin headers format on the wire. Uh, and it also, uh, Zipkin collect, sorry, Jaeger collector can also receive data from Zipkin in various formats that Zipkin support. Um, it, it can even read from Kafka, like in the, in the Zipkin 3 format, for example. Um, now, as I promised, let's talk about quickly about sampling. So first of all, why do we sample, right? Why, why it's even a topic? Um, and the problem is that trace, tracing information is very, very rich. Uh, you imagine, like, as I explained in the demo, for every RPC call, you have two spans on the client and on the server. So each, each span can have all kinds of tags and like attributes uh, like with URLs, it can have logs. So this is pretty bulky objects that we have to ship. And that happens for every single uh, RPC request or actually hundreds of the RPC requests, right? So the, the volume of data accumulates pretty fast. Um, and, uh, so if your service is doing like, I don't know, 10,000 10, RPCs, uh, imagine how much data you're gonna accumulate per second. Uh, so storing all of that can incur pretty large storage costs. Uh, 
Uh, that, that's one reason for sampling. But another reason is that uh, just collecting all this data from your application also has an impact on the performance of your application. So you may introduce latency because you're wasting CPU cycles on, on processing all this data. And so sampling is usually the technique to deal with that overhead and with the, with the um, uh, large storage cost to avoid them. Um, uh, so there are two types of sampling that uh, typically used in the tracing system. One is head-based sampling, where the sampling decision is made at the very beginning when the trace is just starting. So when we create a new random trace ID, we flip a coin and say, okay, we're gonna sample it or not. And once we make that decision, that decision is fixed for the life of the trace. And it's propagated as part of the trace context so that every other service which participates in that trace, it will use the same decision so that you don't get like uh, partial traces somewhere here. Uh, and uh, because uh, that is pretty cheap way of doing the sampling, it has very minimal performance overhead, especially when the trace is not sampled, all your uh, instrumentation is really effectively a no-op. Um, you, you, you get very little overhead. Um, and this is the default mode that's supported by Jaeger SDK. The downside of upfront sampling is that uh, your 99% of your requests in the system are gonna be normal and not particularly interesting, right? You really wanna look at uh, outliers in terms of latency, maybe errors, uh, and uh, those happen much more rarely. And as a result, if you also, in a, like, let's say they happen one in a thousand times, and plus you also have a sampling rate in one in a thousand, then really your chance to get a, an outlier or anomaly is one in a million. Uh, so that, that's kind of a, a bad thing about head-based sampling. And unfortunately, there's not much that can be improved about it because uh, it simply doesn't know anything about what will happen to the trace when it makes a sampling decision. It's like done at the beginning. Uh, and so um, the way the head-based sampling is done in Jaeger is that each SDK can be configured with different samplers. You can say, use probabilistic sample like a coin flip with a certain rate, or you can use rate limit and say like this many per second. Uh, but uh, the interesting part is that is that all SDKs support so-called remote sampling where, as I mentioned in the architecture diagram, the configuration actually comes from the backend. Uh, and that's very powerful because uh, when you have very many services in your architecture and many different teams running those services, those teams don't necessarily know what kind of sampling is good for, for that system. Uh, they also don't know when the traffic patterns changes and how do you need to reconfigure the sampler or redeploy the application. Uh, whereas when the configuration comes from the, from the center location, you can do all of that in a much more intelligent way. Uh, at minimum, you, you give control to the sampling to the team that runs the tracing infrastructure so that they have sort of like levers in terms of how much traffic they want to ingest. Um, and, uh, but you can also make something more intelligent, like adaptive sampling, which calculates things on a sort of a control loop uh, and reacts to traffic spikes. This is what we use at Uber. Um, and uh, the one thing is, is also interesting is the configuration can be done per service and per an endpoint. So it's very often the case that a given service may have multiple endpoints with very different uh, rates of, of queries to them. Uh, or request. And so you don't want to sample everything at, let's say, 1% if the difference, if you have multiple like orders of magnitude in, in the QPS of the endpoints. So this configuration allows you to do at the individual level. And uh, so you can read the documentation of how to configure it. Uh, now let's talk about tail-based sampling. So tail-based sampling is, is a different, uh, completely different mode where the sampling decision is made at the end of the trace. And because of that, it can be much more intelligent. We can look at the latencies, we can look at the errors or some logs, whatever. Uh, anything that looks interesting in the trace, we can, we can affect how we sample those traces uh, um, in, in an interesting ways, right? However, that uh, requires that uh, all these traces still need to be stored somewhere because um, like traces are distributed, you have all these spans coming from all these different applications. You kind of need to assemble them all in one place first. Uh, and you don't want to store them on disk during that assembly time because uh, then the, we defeat the purpose of sampling. We, we want not to hit the disk because it's very expensive. So it really means you have to allocate a lot of memory to store all these traces until they're done and you can make a sampling decision. Fortunately, they're all short. Usually traces like last no more than a second. So most of them can be expired from memory very quickly. So it doesn't necessarily introduce a lot of memory overhead. Um, uh, but there are some like architectural uh, things you need to do to, to support that. Uh, and another, uh, another kind of downside of tail-based sampling is that because we need to collect all the data from, from all this, every single request, uh, that means that it, it has the maximum performance overhead on your application. 
right? And so it's a trade-off whether you want to afford that and maybe in, increase in latency. Uh, you can sometimes combine the tail-based and head-based sampling. So let's say instead of sampling one in a thousand, you say, well, let's sample one in 10, but then do like for every 10th, we kind of do the tail-based sampling. So that, that allows you to control the costs um, and performance overhead. Uh, so how sampling tail-based sampling works in Jaeger? So there's nothing that needs to be done on the Jaeger SDKs because you simply configure them with either 100% or like a fixed percentage. Uh, where the, the, what the magic happens is really in, on the back end, but Jaeger components themselves don't support tail-based sampling, but we now release uh, new components called open telemetry collectors. Uh, those are Jaeger binaries specifically built with from the open telemetry collector we just support tail by sampling and you can configure those collectors with various sampling rules by like latency or certain tags like error tags um, unfortunately at this point uh, open telemetry collector only supports a single node mode which means if you can fit all your traces uh, in one node memory then you're okay but if you need a kind of a, a scaled out solution uh, then that's not currently available, but there is work already happening uh, and there is a blog post by Grafana how they did it. Uh, so it will, uh, it will be available in the near future. Uh, and finally, uh, to close this, I mentioned that I want to talk about uh, Open Telemetry. So Open Telemetry is a new project in, in CNCF, which is a, um, it, uh, it's a descendant of Open uh, tracing and open census, these two projects merge, and it deals with, uh, again, establishing a unified instrumentation framework so that you can reuse the instrumentation in multiple applications, right? It does not deal with the backend collection of traces, except for the collector, which is kind of an intermediate piece. Uh, so to, to illustrate that, let's say uh, we're, we're dealing normally with Jaeger and open tracing. This is how Jaeger historically evolved. And so you have application, your application at the top, there's like three types of applications that typically can be instrumented for tracing. Some of them are explicitly instrumented directly in your code. You can start spans and write uh, various um, metadata into it. Or more often you're in the middle uh, box here where you use some RPC framework, which comes with middleware for tracing. Um, or there's another option where you can, uh, like sometimes there are, um, in certain languages, there are auto instrumentation facilities where you can just attach a library to your binary and then you magically get traces. Like in open tracing, it's available, for example, in Python and in Java. Um, and then all these instrumentations, they talk through open tracing API, which, uh, as I mentioned, calls back into the Jaeger SDK and then Jaeger SDK sends the data back to the Jaeger backend, right? So it's very kind of all clear here. So now what happens with open telemetry? Uh, so open telemetry presents a different, slightly different API than open tracing. It's conceptually still very similar traces and spans and, and, and everything, uh, but the method names are slightly different. So, but you can just use the different types of instrumentations for open telemetry. And then uh, you don't have to have uh, or run Jaeger SDK. You can just run standard open telemetry SDK, which is included in the project in all languages, right? And then that uh, SDK has the ability to export data directly in the Jaeger format. So you can still have Jaeger agent or Jaeger collector accepting Jaeger data spans, uh, but you can also alternatively run open telemetry collector directly, uh, which, and then export data in the open telemetry format, which uh, is kind of a, a standardized way now to represent traces and Jaeger is gradually migrating to that. Uh, and then, Open telemetry collector will still be able to forward data to, to Jaeger backend mm -hmm. in the format. Um, and uh, so, as I mentioned, Jaeger uh, components now uh, exist that extend open telemetry because collector in open telemetry is written in Go. We can just use it as a library. So, we've built our own versions of those binaries, uh, which have the same capabilities as, as um, open telemetry upstream collectors, but with additional Jaeger extensions, which are kind of uh, specific to Jaeger. For example, we can plug in directly our storage implementations into a collector so that you don't have to run like multiple services to, uh, to push the data through. Um, and we're also converting uh, Jaeger uh, implementations for storage now to work directly with the open telemetry data model, uh, which is slightly richer than open tracing uh, because it will uh, kind of provide us better compatibility and uh, pass forward. Uh, and so we're trying to uh, kind of reuse all the good things that open telemetry is building so that we can reduce the efforts we need to maintain, for example, all the Jaeger SDKs, which was pretty expensive um, work in the past. Um, so if you want to learn more about uh, 
uh, Jaeger, uh, you can you can uh, attend a deep dive, which will happen uh, on the next day. Uh, and so Pavel will be talking about more about Jaeger architecture and other things. And finally, these are uh, the ways that you can get in touch with uh, with the community of of Jaeger project. There is a blog post, there is a Twitter account that you can follow, and there is an online chat where you can go and ask questions, things like that. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.